All right. Hello, everybody. It's time for class number two. I believe this is Thursday for you um, on the Epistles of John. I hope that you enjoyed the first one. We're going to move forward. We did uh, an introduction last time, and we did the first four verses of 1 John chapter 1. We're going to do the rest of 1 John chapter 1 now. I'm going to spend a lot of time digging into what it's being said, because these are the message. We're going to start seeing the message that's coming. So we're dec he's declaring to us Jesus. But what's the message? And he's going to declare to us this message. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, start off by just reading uh, 5 through 10 and maybe 2, 1 a little bit, just to give you context. So this, then, is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word, his word, is not in us. You're going to find that being a liar is not a good thing here. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, and etc. That's chapter 2, verse 1, just to give us some context. So in this passage, we've broken it up into two pieces. Uh, 5 through 7, we're talking about this then as the message then he's going to expound upon that a little bit. So what is the message? He's now said to us already, up here earlier, he declared and said, we have, what we've seen and heard, we declare to you that you can have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write that your joy may be full. So this is, this is it. Who are we writing about? We're writing about Jesus. This is all about Jesus. That's what this whole thing is. So this is the message which we have heard of Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you what the message is. And we declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's the message. God is light and in him is no darkness. So, I mean, what is light? What, how are we to understand that? So let's look at a few scriptures that just use the same word. This word in the Greek is phos. It's to shine or make manifest. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. Let's see what that has to say. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And Jesus began to preach and said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is it. The people that sat in darkness saw a great light. Who was the light? Jesus. God is light, and in him is no darkness. Jesus came and declared the Father. He declared light to the people. And his preaching was, Repent, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 35. And let's see. Um, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness. If the whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle does give thee light. So, What's that message? This is the message. God is light, in him is no darkness. Take heed that the light which is in you do not be darkness, because if the whole body is full of light, having no dark part, the whole is full of light. In other words, you're not full of light if there's any dark part. And he's saying, God is light, in him is no darkness. Here's the message. There is a light, and there is a dark. You want to be all in the light, and have no part dark. You want to have fellowship with God? So what's the next verse? If we say we have fellowship with him. There are many, and you know of many, who claim to have fellowship with God. 
They say, we have fellowship with him. We have fellowship with him. But we continue to walk in darkness, or we continue in sin, or we all have sin, and we all fall, and we all have failures, and we all have, and there's a lot of mistaken things. Things that are talked about that are not even really sin, and they'll call it sin. And then things that are sin, and they'll call it not sin. And then they'll say that that which was sin is not sin to me. And then all the things that you've heard, that we've preached against most strongly, it says if we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not do the truth. Because as we just read, if the whole body has no part dark, then you're full of light. Be beware that your darkness, you do not mistake the two. If we walk in the light, verse 7, as he is in the light, we're back to we have fellowship. So we got those that say they have fellowship, but they walk in darkness. They're liars. So we, we know being a liar is not good. All liars have their part in the lake of fire. We don't want to be a liar. You don't want to say you have fellowship and walk in darkness. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, then you have fellowship with us, with one another, and our fellowship is truly with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you have that fellowship, which we talked about last class, just that oneness, that joining, this is something, this is really, for lack of a better term, it is a joining of the Spirit and the manifestation of God Himself in us. That's what this fellowship is. This fellowship is not that we agree about certain principles and you know, because we all agree to these 10 points, then we have fellowship. That is man's fellowship. We They continued in the doctrine. That doctrine's good. I'm glad that we agree on these 10 points. I'm glad that we agree on these 20 things. I'm glad that we agree. That is wonderful. Better to agree. But fellowship is something more. Fellowship is that oneness with God. And in that oneness with God, the manifestation of our life are the things of God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. Wow. Why then did people not come to light? So let's go to look at John chapter 3. Jesus is going to be talking about this very same subject. And he's going to talk in verse 18, just after the famous John 3, 16. He that believeth on him, he that believeth on Jesus, is not condemned. So if you believe her, you're not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he didn't believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. You want to understand condemnation? Light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Wow. So listen to it again. Verse 6 of 1 John 1. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. What did he say here? They do not the truth, in the sense they lie. Light has come in the world, men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil, and they that do evil hate light. They don't come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be reproved. But he that does the truth, the opposite of the one who does not the truth, he comes to the light. In other words, he as we walk in the light as he is in the light, he that does truth comes to the light, same thing, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. That's the, how the deeds are made. Look, we understand what it means to be born again. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the fact that all things are made new, all things are of God. I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man. You come into the life with him. We talked a little bit about the life. You come into that life. His life is shared with us. We join with him. We're born into his family. We are children of God. We are the sons of God, the Father. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. He that does the truth, John three twenty one, 
comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. That's the same message. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. God is light and him is no darkness. Everything from here on out has to be understood in this context. This is the message. This is the context. This is what is said. Um, I want to look at a, just a couple of more light scriptures because I just want to get a few of these into the mix. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. And it says this. Uh, let's back up a little bit. He's talking about you know the catching away. We spent some time talking about that in a previous class. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Verse 4, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Don't let us sleep then. Let's not be drunken then. Let's be sober. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. He died for us, etc. So you see this here. You're all the children of light. These are very important points here. God is light. In him is no darkness. Do not agree with darkness. A very, very important point. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. First Peter 2, 9 says this. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of darkness. Up out of darkness. Over out of darkness. We are out of darkness and into his light. You had not obtained mercy before, but now you have obtained the mercy of God. He's brought you into his light. Wow, amazing. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In him was life. We commented on the scripture last week, or last class. The life was the light of men. So when we talk about the life that's in God, it's also the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it, would not grab a hold of it, would not seize it, would not come to it. This is all implied in all of that. Um, they just refused because they would not come to the light. So this message of light exists in multitudes of other places. It's also in other places in 1 John that we're going to see light come up again. Um, let me read another one. Um, just, just for completeness sake, let's do Colossians 1.12. Just want to really get this clearly in your spirit, understanding what's being talked about. Colossians 1.12, if you're all there. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He's made us able, well able, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. This is why it's so important to come to the light. I'll tell you, when you're a sinner and you come to the light, your deeds are going to be reproved. But the sinner who has seen the light and seen it for what it is, is so happy to have their sins removed that with joy they will run to the light. The one who loves the deeds of evil and loves the way of evil they will not run to the light. They will not turn to the light. They will say they have fellowship with God, but they walk in darkness. So anybody who's preaching and saying to you, well, yes, I have fellowship with Jesus, but I live in sin every day, they may just be misunderstanding. Maybe they really have a genuine born-again experience, but they've been taught wrong. That's a problem we need to work on. We need to help them with that. Just gently take them to the scripture, begin to read it to them, begin to begin to see, and to think different than they've been indoctrinated to think. But there are other people who they love the deeds of evil, and they want to justify the deeds of evil, and they want to 
be accepted for the deeds of evil. This is what so many of us in you know political circles have trouble with is when you're dealing with these people who love their sin and want you to accept their sin and call it normal and we would say no we refuse to call it normal we refuse to call it right um, and it becomes a problem but I don't want to get off on all that the important thing is God is light and in him is no darkness so then we need to look at cleanses from all sin because this is a super important point we have fellowship one with another. Why? Because we ran to the light. We turned to him. We believed on him. And we went to the light to take the light, to seize the light, to embrace the light would be a good way to say it. Um, John chapter 1 verse 29 says this. We, we read it last week. But the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. This understanding of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin is extremely important. Um, it is the reason sin could be taken away because of the blood of that sacrifice that he made. Let's look in John chapter 13, verse 10. Um, this is the context, Peter, you know, you, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter says, not my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus says to him, he that washed, is washed, needs not except to wash his feet, but is clean in every way. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should behave, who, who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Listen to that. In that room, 12 disciples. You are clean, but not all of you are clean. Because he knew who was going to betray him. Isn't that amazing? He still washed his feet, though. Beseeching him, pleading with him. We want to be clean. Well, how do you get clean? Well, you don't want to betray him. We can say that for sure. How do we get clean? Well, the blood of Jesus Christ is that which cleanses us from all sin. It is an extremely important point. But I want to move on into the next part of what we're reading. And that is 1 John chapter 1, 8 through 10. A very commonly misused, misunderstood section of the scripture. We started with this is the message. God is light and there is no darkness in him. And if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with him and all our sin is washed away. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Who is he talking about when he says that? I just read, he cleansed us from all sin. If you say you don't have any, you're deceived. Is that what he's talking about? The truth is not in us if we say we have no sin. So if I want the truth in me, i got to admit i got sin. No. Let's relate this to some place earlier. He says here, If you say you have fellowship and walk in darkness, you lie and do not the truth. So the best way to understand this is to look in John chapter 9. I'm going to read a section, and I'm going to come back to it. John chapter 9, verse 34. And they're talking, the Pharisees are talking to the man who was born blind, that Jesus healed. And they said to this man, You are altogether born in sins. Do you teach us? And they cast him out. The manifestation of the glory of God. Remember we talked about John the Baptist declared who Jesus was. And Jesus talked about, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they could not answer. They would not answer. Because they knew that either answer they would lose. And then he said, we said that the glory of God and the manifestation of the miracles declared who Jesus was. So here's a miracle. It's unheard of. A man who was born blind, totally made well, can see 
absolutely over the top excited. It's filling the marketplace. It's filling the temple. Everybody's hearing the story. The Pharisees call the man in. They're grilling him. They grill his parents. They're, they're having to deal with this. This miracle is declaring that the light is made manifest. But they conclude, ah, you were born in sin and you're going to teach us. And they cast him out. That means they cast him out of the synagogue. He's no longer a part of the family of God. He's no longer in the covenant. I mean, they kicked him out completely. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, You have both seen him, and it is he that talks with thee. In other words, what we have seen, who we have looked upon, of the word of life. He's saying, I am him. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He turned to Jesus. He embraced the light and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world that they which see might not see or might be made blind. And that they which see, they which, that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. So, if there's the ones who don't see, they're going to be made able to see. But the ones that that um, see, they're going to be made blind. And the sum of the Pharisees, which were with him, notice the Pharisees followed him a lot. They're watching. They're trying to evaluate this guy. And I believe many of them turned to him, you know, at the end. But um, it was it was just a few. And some of the Pharisees with him heard these words, said to him, "Are we blind also?" Jesus said unto him, "If you were blind." You wouldn't have any sin. But now you say we see. Therefore your sin remains. Oh my. What does that mean? Is that the way I'm supposed to walk now? Let me ask this question. Did Jesus see? Yeah, he did. Was he blind? No. So was he one that this fits it? If we say we see, your sin remains? No. It's the sin that's the issue. The sin has to be cleansed. The sin has to be taken away. And the light was made manifest, and they saw it was shining to them. He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. They refused him. They would not believe on him. They would not embrace the light. They would not turn to the light. Their deeds would be reproved, but they would not. Jesus declared, how long, O Jerusalem, have I gathered, I wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks, and you would not. You refused me. I came to my own, and my own would not receive me. They said, we see. You were born in sin, they said to the man who had been born blind. Why should we even listen to what you have to say? Because we are better than you. Therefore, they were made blind, because their sin remained. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You do not want to be that one who says, well, I have no need of Jesus. I, I, you know, they'll say in another place, we have Abraham to our father. We don't need you. Oh, yes, you do. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He, they would not come to the light. And therefore, they did not the truth because they walk in darkness. They continue to walk in darkness saying that they can see. These ones go forth saying they have fellowship with us, but they don't. And they do not see. And they continue to say that they do see. And that they walk in fellowship, but they are liars because they walk in darkness. They will not let their deeds be reproved. They will not let their sin be taken away. So is that the, the state of the rest of my life? I've got to continually walk in the fact that I, I have sin, but I don't have sin. I have sin, but it gets cleansed. I have sin, so I can do the truth, so I can walk in fellowship, so the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. Then I have to admit I have sin, so that, no. That is not continuing life. It starts with this, verse 8. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If you say that you walk in the light, but you walk in darkness, you deceive yourself. There's no truth in you. You do not the truth. And you have no fellowship with us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, if we recognize our need, confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every 
form, every part of unrighteousness completely cleansed from all unrighteousness. You have to begin at this place. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You have to come to God and say, I have need of you. So that at the end of the day, you recognize that everything you have received has been wrought by God. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Wrought, everything is made brand new. We are wrought of God. Everything is made of God. This is very, very important. That's what's being said here. It's just said in a very compressed form. As we talked about many of these themes in First John, you go back to John, you can find them in more extensive form that Jesus taught. But he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Same thing as it's up here. He says, look, if you have fellowship, you walk in the light, you have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. It says here, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what he does. Isn't that glorious? Verse 10, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We cannot say that we are thou of those who've never sinned. Yes, we were sinners. That's what Paul said, I was a sinner, but not anymore. I've been made brand new. This thing I have received is the life of God in me. It is absolutely important that we talk about that. So I want to go over a little bit. I want to read some out of Pastor Mark's commentary on this section. because so I've given you uh, a one-way to read it. There's a lot more detail in the commentary, and I want you to spend a little time with it. So I'm on chapter 8, or um, 1 John 1, 8 of that commentary. It's page 8. Um, and he's talking about some Greek things and, and things that we need to understand. So let me just break in here on footnote 14. It, he's talking about verse 8. If we should say we have no sin, and then footnote 14. The present tense condition of those who've not been born again and washed with the waters of regeneration. And then he says, look at Titus 3.5. So let's just do that. Let's, let's be diligent about these things. Let's look at Titus 3.5, probably one that many of you know by heart. He's saying, listen, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Understanding it's not the works of righteousness that we do that bring salvation. It was the work of Jesus that brings salvation. It's very, very important. So the present tense condition is, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. You have not come to the light. If you say, I have no need of the light, then you do not come to the light. Or you do not come to light because you don't want your deeds to be made manifest. You do not want to see the darkness get destroyed. You love the darkness. You want to hold on to the darkness. If I come to God with darkness, that darkness will be destroyed. It can't be any other way. So if I love my darkness, I have to hide it from God. I have to turn from God. I can say that it's out of fear, but it's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. To run and hide from God like Adam did in the shame of your sin is not the fear of the Lord. It's not the same thing. The only way that your sin will be taken away, this is one of those things that it's worth getting clear, looking at all the scriptures on the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, because every religion that's out there, including many Christian religions, do not understand this. You want your sin taken away, then you need the blood of Jesus Christ. But many do not want their sin taken away. They want to be justified in their sin, both Christian and non-Christian. They have their ways. Ask anybody in a different religion about how they get their sin taken away. It's a great way to begin to talk about the fact what God did for us, what Jesus did for us, is he shed his blood to take all of our sin away. But if I go about, which is the common doctrine that you hear, you know, if you listen to any news commentator or anybody that's, you know, in in the government talking about Christians. And it's like, well, we all know that we're all imperfect and we all know that we all have sin. We've all, you know, let him have sin, no sin, cast the first stone. And they, they, these things they all know. And they'll talk about how they're justified in remaining in their sin because after all, everybody does. When you hear that stuff, recognize they're deceived. 
and they're deceived because they have not turned to the light. Or the light has not been manifested to them in the way that God wants it to be. And the Lord is so good about making sure the light is manifested to giving every man an opportunity to turn to that light. The, as, as it said, these things were not done in a corner, as Paul said. Um, these things were not hidden from men. It was known what was done and what happened. And then it was declared throughout the whole earth and is still being declared throughout the whole earth. These things of the light being manifested, the kingdom of God. But now we got Christians supposed Christians saying they have fellowship with us, with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, accepting sin as the normal state of the believer. And that is not the case. So, the next verse is, he says, if we skip down, the most important aspect of the next three verses is to underscore the need for Christ Jesus and the provision that's been given to cleanse us from sin. If we are brought into the family of God and have the fellowship of walking in his life and light, then we have the cleansing blood that has washed us from our sins. Before we come to Christ Jesus, we are all sinners, yoked by sin and death, and are in need of forgiveness and cleansing. The next verse will highlight that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Also, the preceding verse revealed that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Although the initial state is one of sinfulness, the result of God's great salvation is one of purity and holiness. This is extremely important because people will take these things out of context. I, I remember very vividly the first time this was done to me. Very young and the Lord did not know much. Um, I was learning fast. I was studying hard. I was going after God, but I did not know how to answer these things. I just didn't have have the wherewithal to handle it. And and there were a number of scriptures that were thrown at me. And one of these was saying, you, if you say you have no sin, you're deceitful. Therefore, you're the one who's not in the truth. Just throwing the scripture totally out of context. And I knew that that was wrong, but I could not s express it in a way that they would listen to. And I thought, oh, it's because of my failure. It really isn't. If I just said, said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that would have been the right thing to say. <laughs> you know, it would have said if we have fellowship with him, if we turn and walk in the light, we have fellowship with him and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. That's all I had to say. I didn't have to know much. Just let the scripture speak for itself. But there's such a hatred of the darkness or a hatred of the light and a love of darkness in their life. And they they don't want to hear anything that the Word of God has to say. So they get angry with you and you begin to question yourself as if there's something wrong. Is there something wrong with me? Maybe I'm just not smart enough. Maybe I'm not knowledgeable enough. Maybe I'm not good enough at this. Maybe I'm just a failure. When none of that was necessarily true. Really what it's about is just knowing the simple Word of God and speaking the Word of God. These things are extremely clear when you hear them. In other words, you want to do right. This is very easy, because when you see the light, you run to it. When you run and hide from it, we got a problem. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If you, you start in a place, like the Pharisees started, where you think you see, and you're not going to listen to those that you think don't see. The truth's not in you. And because the truth's not in you, because you haven't come to the light. If you confess your sins, he's faithful just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Cleanse. Just like he cleanses from all sin, cleanses from all unrighteousness. When you're cleansed from all sin, how can you then say, I am a sinner? It doesn't even make sense. You can't believe that. But if you say you have not sinned, see, now it's as if I've never sinned. Well, that's not entirely true. You were a sinner. I, I was a sinner. Paul said I was even first a sinner. You were, but now you've come into his marvelous light. Let me look at a couple more things in this commentary. I'm just going to skip down. Um, the paragraph, two paragraphs down, where it starts out, everyone who has the truth 
Everyone who has the truth abiding in them would admit that sin is the evidence that all are in need of redemption. I mean, that's what sin is the evidence of, that you have need of redemption. Paul spends a lot of time in Romans laying out the thing that all are condemned in sin, everyone, Jew and Gentile, all are condemned. There isn't a single person without that condemnation. Sin passed from Adam all the way down to you. It passed on every one of his descendants, such that they then sinned, passing their sin down upon their descendants. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible story. Um, therefore, those who have received God's testimony, recognize their sin, reach out to him to be cleansed from their sin. When the word is preached, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. When that word is preached, you hear it. You, the light is manifested to you, and you turn your heart to him. That's what this is talking about. And you can continue to go down through this. I want you to do that. I want you to read it. But he makes the argument very, very well made. Um, the same similar things that we were talking about that we've been cleansed and regenerated and called to be saints. He'll deal with some things in Leviticus. Um, but I want to get to this next part because I said this is something very important for you to know. I'm now on page 9 of the commentary. We're still in the same section. Um, it's a lot of commentary for this thing. It's the second paragraph in on the page starting at, It is the blood. And I wanted to look at this and it, because this is important that you know that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses from sin. It's not works of righteousness that you've done. It's not because you've agreed to the right doctrines. It's not because you hang out with the right people. It's because the blood cleanses you from all sin. It is the blood. And we're going to look at some of these scriptures that he puts in here. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, um, where it's going to say similar things. Chapter 1, verse 7 of Ephesians, Paul writes this, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. This is what we have. We have redemption through his blood. That is the, it is the thing that matters. It is what has to happen. And then it goes on to say, I just got to read this, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and on earth, even in Christ, in whom also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And then it goes on. This fellowship that we were talking about, if we have fellowship one with another, is talking about this, that we've been brought together in one in Christ Jesus, that the representation of the life in me should be the life of Christ Jesus and nothing else. All right, quickly back to this. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Oh, no, let's go to Colossians 1.14. Sorry, I didn't mean to pick this, this one, but we have redemption through his blood. We just read. We go to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 14, I want you to look at that. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's the same thing. It says it again. This is the message. Let's look at the next one. Hebrews chapter 9. Very, very, absolutely amazing scripture. Hebrews chapter 9. Um, looking in verse 14 and verse 22. Let's see what we have to say. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So he's talking about, hey, look, he went in not with his own blood. He entered into, um, I mean, they entered in with blood of bulls and goats. Then he went in with his own blood, entered into the holy place, obtained eternal redemption. The blood of Jesus Christ redeems us, right? We've obtained redemption. If the blood of bulls and goats sanctified to the puring of the flying of the flesh, how much more the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He'll take away the sin. Absolutely. There, for this cause, verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, eternal life. 
Okay, same thing. The redemption of transgressions under the first covenant. What? Sin is the transgression of the law. Why was the law given? Because sin was not made manifest until there was a law to show that it was having an effect. Men could not see it. Hebrews 9.22, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. You want remission of sins? There had to be blood involved. That was an old covenant teaching and manifestation and declaration. And Jesus is the one who went into that place with his own blood and did that for us. Absolutely amazing. Let's just look at the last one there, which is Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I just wanted to make sure that you guys got those scriptures down. They're right there in the commentary, so you have them. But it is important that we know that it's the blood that cleanses from all sin. It's not your works of righteousness. It's not your doctrinal purity. It's not your manner of living. All of those things might be manifestations of what you've received of God, and He works. all your works are wrought in God by God. That's all good stuff. But this is the first work. Let the blood cleanse you from all sin. It says here in the commentary, it only took one offering to take care of the sins of man for all eternity. And that was the offering that Jesus, as the Lamb of God, made at the cross 2,000 years ago. I used to walk around, sing a song. It's just one offering. He made one offering. You know, it's just, understanding. this is my offering that I bring. I bring Jesus. Jesus made one offering for me. He did that for me. And it's understanding that. When we come before God, that's the offering that we bring. Yes, we can offer up sacrifice praise. We can bring offerings and tithes of our substance and things that we receive. Those are all good offerings. Those are all wonderful things. But the offering that I must bring is the offering of Christ Jesus. This is the one I have to have. And then he'll list he lists a bunch of scriptures. We won't go through all of them. Um, and he talk, starts to talk there. This is where you get in a little more depth. And I want you to go ahead and read that. I want you to read this and wrestle with this. But he's dealing with the concept of going into these various rituals that they had in the Old Testament that spoke of specific things. And for me, the thing that sticks up is that Jesus is also referred to as the caparet, the mercy seat of the propitiation. That's where the blood was applied on Yom Kippur. He came and applied his blood there. What was that? It was the great day of atonement. When when the great day of, of, of making them one, having fellowship with God. Understand, I just have to say this, understand that the, the desire of God was to have fellowship with Israel. He wanted to dwell in their midst and be their God. They'd be his people. But they would not. They ran from him on the day of Pentecost and hid. They refused to obey. They complained and murmured and were upset with Moses, the, the representative of God. And because of all their transgressions, early on, he gave them a law so that they could follow it so that they would understand what they were supposed to be doing. I'm not certain he ever intended to give them all of those commandments. His, he, he really wanted them to have fellowship with him. In that fellowship, they would have kept the commandments of God. But all the ritual feasts and washings and whatever was added. Why? Because of their transgressions. The transgressions against fellowship with him. They were hiding from the light. They were going into the darkness. They were, they, they were afraid of, of coming to light because they didn't want their darkness taken away. They did not want to see. They said, we can see well enough. Moses, you go talk to God. That is such an incredible statement. It's hard for us to understand. We look at it. We look at it from many years, many thousands of years later here, and we're, we're going... I don't quite understand what was going on with them, you know. 
how would I have responded in the same place? It really was simply this. God manifested himself in a way less than his fullness, and the light was made manifest to them, the flame and the fire, and they, instead of embracing and coming to it and grabbing a hold of it and running to God, turning to him in the way that he demanded of them, not to go up the mountain, had to stay back, but to turn to him with their heart, they hid their heart from him. And therefore he could not have fellowship with them, just like we're talking about here. The wonder of the New Testament is that when you see your need, that you know that there's a way to take it away. Remember, they were very afraid of God, but they did not have the fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil. And those are two very different things. God doesn't really want us to be afraid of him. He wants us to fear him, to respect him, to honor him. He wants us to learn to do things his way, which is to hate evil. Absolutely. But he doesn't want us to be a bunch of law keepers. He wants us to be those that are in fellowship with him. And that understanding of the depth of God's desire for fellowship bears on all of these things that are said. Listen, chapter 1, verse 7, If we walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That, that is the message. God is light. There's no darkness in him. So when we begin to read these things and we say we have no sin, we just say, like, you need to know you need him. Yes, you do. You need him. It's not like they weren't slaves in Egypt. You know, we were never slaves. You know, it's just like the Pharisees said to Jesus, said, we've never been in bondage to any man. It's like, are you serious? Goodness gracious, guys. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins that cleanses from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We want to keep the truth. My little children, chapter 2, verse 1, this will be the beginning of the next class. These things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The propitiation, the one, the place where he comes and he puts his blood to, to take away all the sin. That's, that's what Jesus does. So, bless you all. We love you very much, and... Um, we will be talking to you again next week, and we'll start in chapter 2, verse 1, class number 3.